Hey guys welcome back to my channel. What if Naruto was legendary son of Kashina and manifested paradox? Movie. Uzumaki Naruto. Age 16. Konohagakure Shinobi. Jinchuriki of the Kayubi no Yoko and the next Hokage hopeful was not in the least bit pleased with the current circumstances of which he found himself in. He'd been under way of training under the way of the toad sages of Mount Myoboku the very same training that his now deceased teacher Jiraiya of the legendary Three Senen had undergone when he was younger. However the training was proving quite difficult for the young Uzumaki due to a key number of factors. 1. He just couldn't shake the feeling every time he tried to let the flow of nature chakra run its course and into his body it caused an annoying throb of pain in the back of his head. Second was the fact that he just couldn't sit still because he just couldn't shake the feeling something really really bad was about to happen, and the most frustrating part was that he didn't know what it was. Thirdly, his tenant was proving to be quite the pain in the ass as its foul chakra was causing the training to be even more difficult than it should be due to having to keep the Kyubi's chakra at bay while at the same time trying to attain this form the toad sages kept saying was the result of completing his training. In all honesty Naruto thought it was complete bullshit, but he wasn't about to be the one to get whacked in the head again by that infernal wooden cane again. Sitting on the ground Naruto let out a sigh as he once again entered the meditative state he'd been doing for the past few hours. Closing his eyes and slowing down his breathing Naruto relaxed himself, and kept himself at peace, easing his body into a state of relaxation. Then it happened he felt the pull of the nature chakra come toward him circling around him before it slowly start to seep into his body. Its foreign chakra began to seep into his body and through his tenketsu. He could feel its effects affecting his body as everything around him became more surreal and peaceful. However just as Naruto felt that he was just in reach of it his head started to tingle, and a sharp pain spiked within his head causing him to grit his teeth. Kuso not again. It was apparent to the Uzumaki that something was wrong, was he doing it incorrectly, or perhaps it was the Kayubi's doing. Or maybe. Maybe I should try harder put more nature chakra through my body? And as he gripped on what nature chakra he had left in his body he once more let himself become attuned with nature. He ignored the pain in his head as the nature chakra once again began to swirl around him and seep into his body. Unknown to the Uzumaki his eyes started to gain an orange pigment around his eyes. Again equally unknown to him was the veins popping up around his head bulging as blood passed through it more quickly by the second. For Naruto he could feel his reach to what he sought was becoming ever so close, but the pain he felt was equally if not more so painful and it only got stronger the closer he got. But with his ironclad will, determination and high pain tolerance honed throughout his life and career as a shinobi he pushed on. He ignored everything else around him as the nature chakra swelled up inside of him flowing throughout his body like a giant monsoon. Nothing else mattered to him, he had no he must attain this level of power if he had any chance of avenging his sensei. However on the outside the ground he sat on started to crack underneath his body and his body started to glow a glowing shade of azure completely unlike his chakra output. The veins in his bulged even more, and just as he felt his grip clenched upon his goal. It happened, pop. Something deep within him couldn't deal with the strain, he'd overcome the insurmountable wall that held him off from reaching the power he sought. However, something embedded in him, in all human beings, something that was never meant to be strained. Just snapped. Naruto's eyes snapped open to reveal glowing icy orbs before they clenched shut, and Naruto's mouth opened in a gut-wrenching scream. Ah. His scream echoed amongst the land scaring the wildlife, but that mattered little compared to what was happening to him. Blood began to dribble down from his bloodshot eyes, his nose to started bleed as did both his ears. The veins started bulge as more blood started to move quicker and quicker to his brain. Soon the aura started to grow thicker and more powerful before the ground beneath him cratered underneath an unforeseen pressure. His hands went up to his head, clenching onto his skull. His nails digging into flesh in some vain attempt to ward off the pain he was feeling, but it did nothing as the pain only grew hundred times worse. Trying to take a step it only caused the ground to crater again with each shaky step he took, and just as the pain couldn't have gotten any worse. It did, the seal on his naked abdomen appeared as well, and it glowed a dark crimson causing red chakra to ooze out from his abdomen before it mixed in with his aura before it seeped into his head. This had the effect of causing Naruto's screams to become so loud that it caused the clouds in the skies to be blown away. Gripping the sides of his head Naruto's glowing azure eyes closed as images of his life assaulted his mind, events he knew, and events he had long forgotten hit him each time with the power of Tsunade's punches. 
scenes and events from his childhood circulates, events of his birth hit him as everything from his life that has ever happened to him up to his birth erupted into his brain and was revealed at the forefront of his vision. He fell to knees, and soon he felt the pain begin to ease, but that did not help the aftereffects from still haunting him. On his knees with his head held down the bangs of his golden spiky hair shadowed his eyes as the blood from his face dribbled down from his chin before hitting the ground. The aura quickly started to fade as well until it was no longer engulfing his body. Naruto-chan. He faintly heard the voice of the first elder toad he remembered faintly to be called Fukasaku. He could hear him coming toward him, but just as the toad came toward him Naruto brought up his hand halting the toad's advance. I I'm fine pa, perfectly. Fine just give me a few minutes, and I'll be ready to go again. The rough hoarseness in his voice was not lost on the elder toad. Worry etched on his face, but gave a nod either way. Very well. Ma has just said that dinner shall be ready soon, and sent me to check up on you. But if you're okay then I'll leave you to your training. Without another word the toad left the area. When Naruto heard and felt his presence to be gone he raised his hand to wipe away the blood from his face. Raising his head Naruto's eyes peered through the bangs of his hair, but the once full of life azure orbs he once held were clouded with confusion as he eyed the blood on his hand to a glimmering spark of understanding. What just, happened? Maybe I can be the one to answer that for you, Ninjin. The Kyubi's voice echoed from within the depths of his mind causing him to frown, but this time unlike his usual behavior to completely ignore his tenant. He completely obliged, wiping away the rest of the blood from his face he sat back down and let himself delve into his mind which he idly noted to be so much easier than before. Mindscape opening his eyes Naruto's cloudy icy blue eyes stared back into the giant crimson orbs of the Kyubi no Yoko. However he noticed something. First, was the sewer appearance his mind once held now resembled to an empty white void with just a giant black cage that held the strongest of the nine biju. Looking back at the biju he raised an eyebrow in question but his eyebrow arose higher when he saw the strange analyzing gaze in the Kyubi's eyes. I never would have imagined it to be possible, but it seems that even now you seem to do the impossible every time, Ninjin. There was a strange tone in the beast's voice, but Naruto just ignored that for the moment and in favor of walking the Kyubi's cage till he was directly inches away from its muzzle. Looking up into the surprised eyes of the Kyubi he gave a cold gaze as he responded in kind. What do you mean by that? What has happened to me? Why does my mind feel so, clear? He said as he touched his forehead. Images of his life rolled around in his head, and what he saw was further increasing his annoyance had he really been that annoying and naive. Kyubi just kept its gaze on him, but answered nonetheless. Ninjin, due to the nature chakra that you were so engrossed to absorbing to attain the sage mode your brain could not keep up, and due to the natural effects of this chakra, and combining with your unique genes has caused you to unlock the one thing that has never been done in all of mankind's history. Naruto frowned at the Kyubi's words before he looked down in thought, and that was exactly when his mind started to do things it had never done before this incident. It was quickly coming up with theories, and conclusions that was making the Kyubi's words seem more true with each theory. Had the combination of the nature chakra and his genes done something to his brain? Had it unlocked some hidden potential? Had it released a certain mechanism in the brain that caused this effect? Seemingly like it was reading its thoughts, the Kyubi continued. What you have unlocked Ninjin is the untapped potential every mortal posses, but can't nor ever reach. Your brain was reaching its limit, and due to the potential danger your genes, and my chakra tried to deal with the problem by healing your brain, but it wasn't working only halting the process. Because of this your human body reacted in the only way it could, it caused your brain to break the locks that held back its processing power to allow the nature chakra to flow throughout your body without consequence of having you go brain dead due to chakra overload. However just as it was going to continue Naruto already caught on to what it said and reacted nearly on instinct. Because of that my brain's capacity to think and process has reached its maximum. If that's the case why do I feel as more has happened to me? He said while looking down at his hands. The Kyubi gave a hum before it laid down its maw on the cage floor as its eyes peered at Naruto's form with a look of keen interest. I do not know Ninjin, the mysterious of the mortal mind have forever been something that's been unanswered since the dawn of time. The mind of every mortal only works at the capacity of 10%, but you have unlocked yours to its max so I do not know what you have gained or lost in by achieving this. Frowning at that Naruto gave a sigh as he wondered on this new, and potentially excellent or terrible gift. 
Now that he thought about it a lot of things came rushing back at him, and to his surprise everything that came to him was of his childhood, and how he had been treated. How he had acted to gain attention in the smallest form, whether that attention was good or bad didn't matter to him at that point. How he had let himself be verbally and mentally abused, neglected, and downright beaten by kids older than him. Then a question popped up, why? Why had he done this? Why had he let himself become so naive to everything? Why had he let the Sandame basically push and lead him on some fake, and twisted story and tales of how shinobi were heroes to the people and protectors of justice? Why had he let himself fall into that pathetic shell he once was prior to this incident? Why did he let the insults, and abuse even by his own teammates be ignored for so long? Why hadn't he done something? Why hadn't he fought back or even rebelled? Was it out of some deep-seated loyalty to the old man Sandame? Was it out to prove them all wrong? His azure eyes turned cold at that. I have nothing to prove to likes of them. No, I won't waste my time on them anymore. The village, means nothing to me now. Why did I protect a place that loathed my very existence? In fact, why did I let myself be pulled into being a shinobi, and to serve Konoha? Was it so they could have a loyal weapon at their disposal? It wouldn't surprise me. If anyone knew Naruto beforehand, and heard his thoughts they would have thought someone was impersonating him, but this was the truth. He was coming to realize his mistakes, how his loyalty was so severely misplaced, and used time and time again by every single person he thought of as a comrade or friend. The Rookie 12, Kakashi, Tsunade, Aruka, Hiruzen, Jiraiya. Everyone, but no more, I will no longer be the puppet, and the ever faithfully loyal servant that served them. No, I will no longer be bound by the chains of shinobi loyalty and duty. I am servant to no one, and loyal to only myself. For I am Uzumaki Naruto, and from now on, the only person I answer to is myself, all others, can perish for all I care. He missed two things when he said this. One, was the fact the Kyubi was both eyeing him with an extreme look of interest, and its maw growing wide into a foxy smirk. Second, was the fact his eyes were glowing icy blue whilst his body started to give off a light blue aura. This ninjin, no, this new Naruto is extremely more interesting than the last. And his energy, it reminds me a lot of yours old man. Turning his gaze on the Kyubi, Naruto just gave it a nod before he vanished from his mind leaving behind a smirking biju. Life was about to get more interesting, real world Mount Mayoboku. Once Naruto opened his eyes he gave a small sigh before standing up millions of thoughts raced through his mind in mere seconds, but he stopped them as a plan started to come together. As much as it made him detest to stay here any longer he had to agree to gain the sage mode would prove beneficial to him in the long run. After that he would not be here another second longer. However he did know he needed a lot more improvement than just this, and that was why with a single hand sign he spoke. Cage no Bunshin, the area around him erupted in smoke before it dissipated to reveal 61 shadow clones. All of you, get into 6 groups of 10 now. Doing as ordered they began to form themselves up into 6 groups of 10, nodding with approval Naruto spoke again as he pointed to each group as he listed off each duty. Group 1. You are to take to the forest and start working on mastering each chakra control exercise we know, and create new ones and start on them. Above all things he knew his chakra control was atrocious due to his high level reserves even without the Kyubi so that was the first thing that needed to be improved. Then he turned to the second group. Group 2, take to the mountains, and start mastering our control over the wind element. I will not have our control to be mediocre. I want it to be perfected by the time we leave this Kami forsaken mountain. It made him actually feel annoyed that he hadn't even improved upon his control before now. Why hadn't he taken the time to improve his mastery of the element? Because just gaining some form of control to create the Rosin Shuriken was just being lazy at best. Plus he knew that out of all the basic elements, wind was both the most unpredictable and dangerous of them all. Group 3, you are to train in dispelling Genjutsu. Though Genjutsu had never been his forte he would not be letting this be a weakness for his enemies to exploit any longer. Dispelling Genjutsus were more important than casting them and when he had mastered the skill to dispel the highest level of genjutsu he would work on creating his own. Group 4, you are to work on perfecting our kanai precision and accuracy because as it is it's still a joke to for it to only be at genin class. Though some would call this the least important he would beg to differ. To master the kanai would mean complete mastery over the art of killing. For even a kanai can kill a man, and bring down the mightiest of foes with stab to the heart, 
a plunge into their skull or slitting their throat. Turning to next group he pulled up his sleeve before biting his thumb, running his blood over a small seal over his forearm. In a poof of smoke a book with the title of, The Fundamentals of Fuenjutsu, a gift given to him on his 16th birthday by Jiraiya, but at the time he hadn't put much thought into working with Fuenjutsu because it all sounded and looked too difficult for him. A mistake he would remedy right now. Group 5, take this book, and head toward the outer forestry and begin work on advancing our theories and experiments in Fuenjutsu. He tossed the book to the leader of the group. Before this incident he hadn't shown much appreciation for Fuenjutsu besides the average seal for storage scrolls, but now he felt his interest in this subject to be extremely stronger. The potential for Fuenjutsu was literally endless, and for Naruto just theories about it caused him to feel a bit excited to get into the subject. Plus he now felt his blood begin rush when just thinking about Fuenjutsu and all the prospect and potential is wielded alone. Group 6, you are to work on Taijutsu I want the muscle memory of every stance we have learned over the years to be honed and perfected. We will work on combining what we have learned so far into a style fit for my body's natural reflexes, instincts, speed and strength. Though he hadn't tried it when he was his old self he had learned a various few Taijutsu styles but his body at times felt too stiff or just didn't feel right when just using any of them. However each style held a key component that he felt could prove beneficial if combined with other components from other styles he's learned. Now you have your orders, go, hi. As they dispersed into different directions Naruto turned towards the giant boulders that littered the area, feeling rush of theories and thoughts begin to formulate in his mind he decided to act on it, Raising his hand to one boulder he focused on the boulders in front of him with outstretched hand causing them to rumble before each started to float up in the air. Now time to learn what it is that I've gained from this, gift. Five days later Fukasaku didn't know what it was that had changed in the young Naruto, but ever since the incident with him gaining sage mode he'd been a lot more driven in his training. He'd showed remarkable progress in senjutsu training as he had attained sage mode, and had already started on learning the frog kata style. It was very surprising to say the least, however the old toad felt his spine gain a chill when as he looked down at the note in his hands if this was true. Then they had no time to waste, Shima Asem. There is no need Fukasaku, Naruto's voice gained his attention before he looked to his side to see Naruto holding the letter with a frown on his face. Not much had changed outwardly for Naruto except his hair had grown out a bit, it now reached past his shoulder blades, covering his ears whilst his golden fringes nearly shadowed his eyes, but that may have been due to his deep exposure to nature chakra during his training. His clothing however was different as Naruto threw away the atrocity he wore after accidentally tearing it up in a sparring match with a clone. So now he wore clothes from Jiraiya had used during his younger days, black janin pants with black sandals. A long-sleeved black shirt with the first Hokage necklace hanging below the collar. He had denied to wear the green vest of all Janins, but never specified as to why, but he did take a pouch or two, as a gift from Shima, and accepting it he now wore a short-sleeved red coat with black flames licking the bottom. Inside however was a different story, and one no one knew besides the Uzumaki himself. But Naruto-chan if that letter is true then we'll need all the help we can get, he said only for the Uzumaki to put the letter down before he stood up from the table. Turning toward the toad he gave him a impassive stare which the toad had to hold back a flinch his stare could be quite frightening when his azure eyes turned icy though the toad would think it was because the boy held an extreme hate for the man that killed Jiraiya. But that was entirely wrong, Naruto had come to know death was normal for the career of a shinobi. That did not exclude shinobi such as Jiraiya's stature and people who thought otherwise were not worth his time. No his annoyance was along the lines of other revelations he's come to realize during his secluded training. I will be fine Fukasaku sensei just reverse summon me to Konoha. I will deal with pain, he said, and for the longest time the toad stared into the eyes of Naruto who stared right back before the toad gave a sigh. Very well Naruto-chan, I'll trust you on this, but be careful out there, he said as he began the hand seals. Naruto just gave him a nod as he stood ready for transport. Don't worry, pain won't know what hit him. When he said this his eyes glowed for the briefest second before they stopped before the toad even saw it happen. Then when the toad used the final hand sign, Naruto vanished in a poof of smoke. And that would be the last time Fukasaku or Shima would ever see Naruto on their mountain. Konohagakure crater. This couldn't be happening it just couldn't be, was the mantra Haruno Sakura was repeating over and over again in her head. 
Her jade eyes scanned the giant crater of which once held her home now reduced to a smoldering crater. The bodies of the dead lay strew about in the rubble on the outskirts of the crater where the leftovers of the village lay in ruin. It was a haunting realization, but one that had come upon her. Konoha was not impenetrable as it showed nor was it the strongest if it could be devastated by just one man. The village's strongest had fought, and soundly defeated, and killed one being her own sensei Hitaki Kakashi. But seeing so many dead, and the village laid in ruin caused her to think of the one person who had always helped the village in its most desperate of moments. The image of her blonde-haired teammate flashed in her mind, and she could not hold the scream. Please Naruto, please Naruto hurry back, poof. The the smallest sound of a poof sounded, but everyone heard it amongst the village's own graveyard causing them all to look up to see who had come. Hope bubbled forth in the pink-haired Kunoichi as the smoke dissipated to reveal. Uzumaki Naruto, with pain pain narrowed his eyes as the smoke in his Rinnegan vision erupted, and soundlessly his other bodies appeared at his side. He watched impassively as the smoke dissipated to reveal his target standing in the center of the crater however to his surprise. The boy was alone, so you have come, Jinchuriki of the Kayubi. He stated as Naruto stepped out from the crater. He just glanced his way before he looked around. His gaze swept all across the crater, coming upon the weakened Tsunade and her personal Anbu and all the survivors of the attack on the edge of the crater that was once Konoha. Finally his eyes fell on the Hokage monument for the briefest second. Painful is it not that all of this could have been avoided if you had just given in willingly, but now you must see your home destroyed, and its people slaughtered down to the last man, woman and child. Naruto just glanced back at him, and only gave him an impassive stare. However his once azure eyes were changed to that of the toads to signify his change to sage mode. Nagato saw the change in his eyes and narrowed his eyes for the smallest second. So, the Uzumaki has achieved the same power as Jiraiya Sensei. Interesting and he has no need for toads unlike our sensei. Naruto did not honor him with a response as he just raised his hand and grabbed his headband, and ripped it off his forehead causing the man's eyes to widen briefly before Naruto just clenched it in his hand. I care not for Konoha any longer, this place, this village is not my home nor are its people my concern any longer. Here he raised his headband to Payne's eyes, and as he clenched his hand he spoke with his words speaking volumes. I, Uzumaki Naruto, Effective immediately hereby resign as a Konoha citizen and as a Konoha shinobi. And clenching the headband it started to creak before the metal plate bent under his iron grip before he crushed it in his hand. Satisfied he dropped the object on the ground without the slightest hint of hesitation in his movements. This action caused Payne's eyes to narrow such blatant disrespect and treacherous action was surprising from one known as Uzumaki Naruto considering the boy was known to be loyal to a fault to Konoha. The information on him stated clearly, that the Uzumaki was loyal only to Konoha and would do everything and anything within his power to ensure its safety. What concerned him even more was the fact he was able to bend the metal forehead protector like it was nothing. Although it seemed like a simple matter, the metallic alloy that the forehead protectors were made from were said to be made from the strongest and most durable metal found only from Tetsu no Kuni. Add the fact the boy was staring at him without a look of anger or rage over the result of his home made him feel uneasy. What has happened to the Jinchuriki of the Kayubi? You, are you truly Uzumaki Naruto? He asked his apprehension rising as he looked upon the Uzumaki. His words only got a raised eyebrow from the blonde-haired Uzumaki whom decided to honor him with a response. What kind of a question is that? I am who I am, and that is all you need to know pain or should I say, Nagato. He finished with a small smirk while Payne's impassive facade broke into something akin to a small scowl. I don't how you came upon that name, but it seems I will have more reason to dispose of you. Then with a mental command his Asura path which dashed forward. Extending its limb a multitude of blades popped out from its wrists while a drill seemed to come out of its palm. Keeping his posture Naruto gazed at the incoming body with a studying gaze. So this body like that of a self-made puppet like Sasori. Fukasaku did say each body held a different aspect, but was not able to face them all before Jiraiya's death. Thrusting his hands forward two kanai shot forth from under his sleeves. Gripping them he spun them into a reverse grip before he charged the body. Just as the hand was about to impale him he twisted his body as his kanai blazed to life with futon chakra which stretched along the edges of the kanai. 
Then he spun his body before he landed a few feet from the other bodies while the Asura path froze in midstep before all of its body started to fall to pieces from multiple slashes, lacerations and gashes running alongside every part of its body. A number of them hitting vital areas such as the joints, knees, elbows and neck. But Naruto didn't stop there as he spun and threw a hail of kanai around the fallen body with explosive tags tied around to them. Fizzling out they exploded causing the body be engulfed in a fiery blaze, but Naruto jumped out from smoke before he pulled out another kanai. Turning around he charged the recovering Naraka path, and just as he was about to close in. Shinra Tensai. He felt himself get blown back a few feet, but flipping backwards he dug his feet into the ground to slow himself as he was pushed back by the invisible force of Nagato's attack. However in his mind he was already calculating the attack and was formulating one of his own. So he protected that path from me which means it's more important than the others. The one he used to stop and repel me back seemed to attain the ability of repulsion. Meaning one must have different abilities as well. Narrowing his eyes Naruto did a one hand sign and created a wordless cage bunshin. Why do you persist to stop that which is inevitable Uzumaki? Naruto heard Nagato speak through one of his paths and he decided to listen as he began creating his attack. You face the power that which belonged to the founding father of the shinobi world and god among men, the Rakuto Senen. Why face me when my actions will eventually lead to peace? Nagato continued to question Naruto, deciding to speak to him as a fellow disciple of the late Jiraiya. Naruto's expression remained nearly impassive, only a twitch of a smirk from his mouth was the only indication of emotion from the usually ball of energy that was Uzumaki Naruto. Somewhere deep inside his heart, a piece of him that he had destroyed during his training felt himself go out to the dream of his former sensei, Jiraiya. However his more logical mind quickly overcame that with the cold hard facts he'd come to learn during his self-training. I do believe you only wield a small part of the sage's power. You only have his eyes and that which it gifts you. But you do not have the sheer raw power that entity possessed nor that of his body. So, as of now you only wield, by my calculations one-tenth of his overall power. You also do not possess the skill he had and the natural talent he used to wield it. You are not a god, Nagato, so do not perceive yourself as one, it is disgraceful of one who shares the same bloodline as I, he said causing Nagato's path's eyes to widen in surprise, confusion and slight bits of anger. Nagato caught the silver lining in Naruto's words and his shock was only equalized with his confusion as to how this boy knew about the sage's power, let alone believed in it when the majority thought of it as a myth. So, he knows about me, about himself. He knows of our near extinct bloodline, but how? Soon Naruto continued, as for this talk of peace. I remember Jiraiya speaking of it, that it was his dream to end all conflict in the world. A goal to end all the hatred, anger, and rage in the elemental nations and end the cycle of pain. A dream that I am sure you inherited through him, before you killed him that is. He mentioned noticing the slight narrowing of Nagato's eyes. But you see, I simply refuse to view it that way. Jiraiya was a damned good shinobi despite his faults however his idealism in a world like ours is faulty. No matter how great it sounds, no matter how incredible it may seem. It is only an ideal, and an ideal that goes against the very nature of mankind. Expressing his views Naruto stared deep into the paths of pain, his icy blue eyes seemingly staring right into Nagato. Humans at their core are sinful creatures, we do not possess the ability to keep an everlasting peace. A temporary reprieve of harmony perhaps, but a world of peace that exists forever? That is just nonsense and that is the talk of an idealistic fool. Mankind has shown that they are incapable of that kind of compassion. As of stated, we as a species lust for power, greed drives men to do unspeakable atrocities only to sap their lust for power, wealth, glory or fame. An era or two of peace is very plausible, but war never changes. It comes and goes, it's an endless cycle that was placed upon us at the dawn of time. Have you ever wondered why? It is to keep balance in the world, Nagato. That is enough, Uzumaki. Naruto's eyes glinted as Nagato shouted from one of his bodies. He could clearly see his words frustrated Nagato to cause that outburst. Challenging his resolve like that had shaken him far or than he would ever admit. Exactly as planned, giving a strange smirk Naruto nodded, you're right enough talk, it's time end this little farce. His words understandably confused Nagato, but he had little time to wonder why when his Naraka path suddenly erupted into a poof of smoke. Rinnegan eyes widened in shock when in place of it was Naruto's cage bunshin, 
snapping his gaze forward he cursed when saw his Naraka path bisected at the waist from Naruto's kanai. When did he? But his shock grew when he saw Naruto's hand sign then he heard the sound of paper burning and alarms suddenly ringed in his head. He barely had time to see Naruto's clone give a cold smirk before its appearance began to fade before its tongue, revealed to be one of hundreds of explosive tags. Suddenly it latched onto his human path before he even had time to think of another thought. Bunshin Daibakuha, and the crater was ablaze as an explosion rocked the very crater that was Konoha's foundations. Konoha edge of the crater, whoa, was Naruto always this good? Choji said only for Shikamaru to narrow his eyes as he watched the battle unfold before him, Choji and a few Konoha shinobi. I think the better question to ask is, since when did he get this good? He just took out three bodies on his own when the strongest and elite of us couldn't even kill one. He said making Choji nod but Shikamaru's mind ran a mile a second about Naruto's act before the battle began. He could barely see what he'd done, but he could have sworn he saw Naruto tear off his forehead protector and crushed it. That, slashing through it and leaving the village is an automatic sign of treachery, a display that a shinobi fully renounces his loyalty and duty to his village. But, surely Naruto wouldn't do that. He was one of the most loyal if not the most loyal shinobi Shikamaru had ever seen. Surely, Naruto wasn't becoming like a certain Uchiha they knew. But then, why did he have this uneasy feeling in the pit of his stomach? Konoha crater flying out of the smoke and debris, three of the six bodies of pain skidded back, but none of them had escaped the explosion unscathed. Their Akatsuki cloaks were burned or were in tatters, some had some degree of burns and scorch marks, but overall they were still intact. But that did not count for the human path which had been obliterated by Naruto's tactic. Impressive. He used our moment of discussion to shield his cage Bunshin from switching with my Naraka path, and while taking out the Naraka he filled the clone with enough chakra to destabilize it, covered it in explosive tags and hanged it over as another exact copy, thus adding to the explosive force of his jutsu. Very impressive I must admit, just like. Just like killing two birds with one very explosive stone, right? Rinnegan eyes widened in momentary shock when Naruto literally spoke his thoughts aloud. Peering through the smoke his eyes narrowed when he saw Naruto walking toward him in a slow yet balanced posture. Rinnegan eyes stared back into toad-like eyes which held just a tad bit of amusement as he stared back at Nagato's remaining three paths. D did he, read your mind? Naruto continued as he got closer to Nagato's paths as he waved his hand in a dismissive manner. Don't fret, I'm no Yamanaka, but reading one's mind is a really simple matter when you understand the basics. It's like reading a book really. But no matter how well guarded your mind may seem, it's so easy to bypass all mental defenses and just reach in and find out your deepest darkest secrets. That sent rumble of shock all throughout Nagato's path which traveled back to his real body which gasped out whilst his eyes were widened in morbid horror. But your secrets matter little to me now, cause you see, this battle is my win. Reacting by instinct Nagato's animal path charged, Biting both thumbs it did a hand sign before slamming both hands on the ground as it shouted, Kuchiyose no jutsu. Two explosions of smoke erupted before the animal path, the first that erupted from the smoke was a large brown multi-headed dog with a multitude of piercing that resembled the very same on Nagato's path. Each head's teeth were bared as it charged toward Naruto, its wings unfurled and flapped increasing its speed and the second was a black fur ox with two large curved horns which was speeding toward Naruto at the exact same speed as dog. Watching the two oversized summons hurtling toward him Naruto remained completely composed and in the blink of an eye. The two summons seemingly connected with their target, but to their shock and Nagato's growing frustration they quickly halted in their charge. Their bodies were stopped as Naruto's arm flashed upwards and halted both of them with only both of his hands, but the backlash of the attack sent a shockwave behind Naruto. The ground beneath him cracked and upheaved a few meters behind him yet he remained stone still. Being in sage mode has its benefits Nagato, enhanced strength, you know? But these two seem to be a rather undisciplined bunch best get them out of our way, nay? Lifting his head, Naruto's sage mode eyes glinted in a way that made Nagato feel a sensation he hadn't felt for such a long time. It was fear. With the smallest grunt Naruto lifted both summons into the hair and upon clenching both hands and concentrating his mental capabilities. The two summons suddenly started to feel an invisible force begin to compress all around them, closing in more and more until they were scrunched up into balls. Yet Naruto didn't stop as he ignored their whimpers and groans as their bodies were compressed more, and more and more and more. 
Until their bodies couldn't take it anymore, both summons exploded into puffs of smoke signaling their end as they were sent back to their respective realms. Smoke once again billowed and blanketed the battlefield engulfing Naruto and Nagato's remaining three paths. The sudden and strange attack Naruto used confounded Nagato, it rattled his very mind as to how the Uzumaki was able to do what he just did. It's as if he were controlling the same force I do, but in a variation that is in a compression form. Peering into the smoke he readied his paths, but he was totally unprepared for a shower of boulders heading from his left and right. But reacting at the last second he raised both hands and shouted. Shinra Tensai. The boulders and smoke was blown away, but from the perception of his Prada path he saw something coming from his back and he looked behind him. What came hurling towards him was a spinning chakra attack that had the appearance of a Fuma shuriken with a spiraling blue sphere in the middle, an attack that was very similar to Jiraiya's Rasengan. But he could sense the power in the attack and knew his path wouldn't be able to survive it. Quickly his Prada path jumped in front of him and in trajectory of the attack's path and reached out with both hands. Too occupied by the attack he was a second too late when he felt a distortion in the air. Senjutsu. Rasenrangan. Glancing over his shoulder his animal path was quickly pummeled as Naruto came from the air with two Rasengans in both hands which he promptly smashed into his animal path's ribcage. His eyes met Naruto's before he a slight gasp in front of him and he turned to see the attack his Prada path was about to absorb erupted into smoke revealing yet another Naruto. Too late to react Naruto planted his hand on the path's face and glared straight at Nagato's last path as he uttered one word. Boom. Suddenly and without warning his Prada path began to emit smoke from his eyes, ears, nose and mouth before his skin began to melt and blood began to boil. Sensing the incoming danger he jumped back and his instincts were right as his Prada path quickly ignited and exploded in a fiery blaze taking itself and the apparent cage bunshin of Naruto in its fiery demise. Upon seeing yet another strange power wielded by the Uzumaki was beginning to push Nagato off the proverbial edge. Everything he was witnessing from the Uzumaki was destroying all the data and information he had on the Jinchuriki of the Kyubi and throwing it out to the four winds. The attacks he's used thus far were not of the chakra nature and seemed similar to his abilities to attract and repulse, but seemed too far advanced to be as simple as that. This is the first I've ever been pushed this far, to have lost all my bodies to you. Truly, you are a powerful and talented shinobi to be sure. He said as his eyes narrowed on Naruto who stood a few feet behind him with his animal path at the Uzumaki's feet. This time Naruto didn't seem to honor him with a response and just kept his gaze on Nagato who kept his stony gaze on him as if trying to analyze him before deciding to speak. My information on you has clearly been, inaccurate. You show incredible strategic and tactical awareness, you've not shown to be prone to emotional outbursts and jumping straight in brashly. You've got a handle on futon chakra manipulation on a level that exceeds what was entailed. Let's not forget your overall combat abilities and your unique powers. I must ask, what has happened to you, Uzumaki Naruto? Nagato asked, his curiosity breaching past his edgy nervousness of the man before him. Naruto kept his stare with the man, but at the same time his mind recollected on all that happened after his accident with his Senjusu training. His eyes glazed over for a moment as he remembered all that he had when memories of when he was younger flashed through him, memories that went back to the very night he had been born. It had all come back to him and it had drastically changed his perspective on life after that. I've lost everything. I could have known a mother's love and yet Minato takes that away from me as well and over that ridiculous prophecy. The one true friend I thought of as a brother tried to kill me, the friends. I do have see me as a complete and total buffoon. I am a weapon to be used and disposed of, a carefully yet brilliant plan I must say, Serutobi Hirazan. Well played. Naruto complimented the dead Sandame Hokage as memories of when he was a newborn all the way through his childhood played through. Seeing it for a second time made him realize it, Hirazan was named the professor for a reason and now he knew why. He knew of his status and heritage and manipulated him from the very moment he was born to be loyal to Konoha and trained to become a shinobi. From the very moment he asked him if he wished to become a shinobi to when he saved him after being kicked out of the orphanage at five years of age. Every move was planned, every single notion Hirazan made was his attempts to push him further to become a shinobi to Konoha. Not of his own free will, but through the old man's small nudges here and there that set him on a path that was not one made of his own choices, but pre-planned choices set by a manipulative Hokage. Looking down at his hand a frown marred his whiskered visage as memories of his mother flashed within his mind, the emotional and mental scarring of witnessing her death. 
It was still fresh, seeing her being tortured after just giving birth to him, the Kyubi ripped out of her and being impaled by said Biju and yet still had the power to pin it down and give her last dying words to him. It shattered what left of what was Naruto's heart and soul into pieces and what was left was something that was no longer that ball of sunshine that was Uzumaki Naruto of Konoha. He'd welcomed his suppressed rage, hatred and sorrow back into him yet it did little to repair the damage caused on him. The innocence he once had was gone, his warm and cheery attitude was destroyed and all in place of that was a bitter, cold and cynical man. Although he had made a good relationship with the Kyubi afterwards it did little to change him now. If only I had a chance to change what I've seen, hey what am I thinking such a probability of that is a zero. One percent and even if attempted I'd be crushed. Shaking his head Naruto's glazed expression disappeared before his toad sage eyes narrowed on Nagato. Let's just say I had experienced a change in myself. We all experience something like that. It changes us, shatters our former beliefs and rebuilds us into something else. Be that good or bad, who knows? He said shrugging his shoulders as Nagato soaked up what he had to say before seemingly giving a nod, as if he understood what the blonde was saying. Memories of when his best friend, Yahiko, murdered by Hanzo's force had changed him into what he was today. I see, so you experienced something that like that too, then perhaps we are not so different as you or I may believe. Regardless, I must finish this so be honored Uzumaki Naruto as I use the one technique that not even you shall escape from. It is the very same technique the Rakuto Senin used to seal the Jubi's body and by extension create the moon as we know it. He exclaimed before he clapped his hand together whilst Naruto raised an eyebrow in anxiety. Deciding to see what it was Nagato was speaking about he waited. He didn't need to wait long for as soon as Nagato began to separate his hands Naruto quickly felt that familiar energy sensation and his eyes widened when he saw a small black ball in the middle of Nagato's hand. Naruto. Be careful that technique was the one the Rakuto used to seal away our progenitor, its power cannot be underestimated. I understand Kurama, but something about that orb, I wonder. Looking at his hands Naruto narrowed his eyes. He'd yet to have time to test his use in it let alone even have a level of control he was ideally wanting. But the possibilities of using it to stop Nagato's attack was too high. Naruto, if you use that there is no telling what may happen. Kurama warned him, and Naruto knew the risks but it was the best possible choice besides revealing his trump card. And that was something he wouldn't be unleashing because he knew he had a terrible grasp on its control. So it was with an unspoken decision that Naruto closed his eyes and clapped his hands together. This action confused Nagato who didn't know what Naruto was planning, but remained focused because the slightest slip up would prove disastrous for him. But to his shock Naruto opened his and slowly unhinged his hands to reveal something that chilled him to his very soul, held in his hands was a pure white orb which seemed to give off an unnatural glow. It grew and expanded as Naruto separated his hands and feeling the power in Naruto's strange move Nagato acted first. It's too late, Uzumaki Naruto, Chibaku Tensai, he said hurling the orb up into the sky which shadowed the sun. But Naruto didn't hesitate even as a strange force of attraction began to pull him and everything around him into the orb. Ignoring Nagato in favor of the black orb Naruto let out a grunt before he felt his body begin to get pulled up into the sky. As his body began to get closer to the orb he shouted as he tossed the white orb towards Nagato's technique. White hole. What happened next was something completely unexpected. The white orb shot through the earth boulders and rock in its path before it collided with the black singularity created by Nagato. Due to this the force of the attraction seized for a moment as the white and black orb battled for dominance before the two orbs defied logic and began to meld together into a grey-coloured orb. And then the attraction returned only it was so much stronger and at the very centre of the orb a crack in the very world itself began to appear around it. The crack got bigger as Naruto who was the closest to it began to be pulled by the attraction. The crack got bigger and bigger before it began to open up to reveal a swirling portal of iridescent colors of black, blue, red, yellow, green and other colors. The attraction got so much stronger than and Naruto could do nothing as it pulled him in. D damn it. I didn't expect this to happen. Gritting his teeth he heard Kurama snarl in annoyance at his rather reckless move. Well that's what you get when you censored with space and time, you dumbass. Naruto couldn't respond as the very light around his peripheral vision began to be censored into the wormhole and Naruto could do nothing as the grey singularity vanished into the portal and with it. Naruto himself, she it. 
Naruto screamed before the world around turned dark as he left his former home as he was censored into the wormhole. And along with it his old home was no more, as countless black holes began to appear around the elemental nations which began to pull and tear the continent apart. In single move Uzumaki Naruto and the figurehead of the Akatsuki had just destroyed the entire elemental continent and reduced all life to nothing. Being pulled into these black holes which began to crush all light and matter that was censored it into its never-ending attraction. But, what of Uzumaki Naruto? With Naruto Okami how he hated himself. Stupid 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 stupid. Why the hell did I do that? Naruto yelled within his mind as he hurled through the wormhole all the while Kurama was just laughing at him. Hey, if he was gonna die he would do it mocking his supposed genius of a host for his idiotic move. How the censored should I know? Not even old man was this crazy to mess with the space elements like that and you go throwing something like that to another all willy nilly. I guess there is a little of that dumbass still in you. Ha 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 ha. Grumbling, but accepting Kurama was right about his reckless move, still he sighed he didn't have much left to live for so why was he even worried about it? Besides the possibility of pissing off a god that is, he thought with a morbid frown. Deciding it was best to take what time he had left Naruto let out another sigh before he closed his eyes, possibly for the last time. In doing so, of all the memories or images to come back to him. One in particular flashed in his mind. Gems of pure violet stared down at him. Salty tears of sorrow and sadness fell from a heart-shaped face as long red hair fell around her. Blood pooled from her mouth, but refused to let it fall upon him. Her words echoed throughout his mind, but her face, her heartbroken expression tore at Naruto's very soul. A frown marred his features as he seemingly reached out to the woman, trying in vain to console her even though he knew it would never happen. Ka san, Uzumaki Kashina, how sad it is for our lives to be dealt this hand. Guess the gods really do enjoy playing us in our lives as some sort of sick and twisted game. Feeling a strange begin to overcome him, Naruto figured it was death awaiting him and Naruto soon began to welcome the embrace of death because after all, he had nothing to live for, thus, Naruto's form was engulfed in a bright golden light before he reached the end of the wormhole. Konohagakure outskirts of Konohagakure Naruto didn't know what happened next, but when he felt the strange sensation stop he immediately felt another sensation overcome him. And that was pain, lots of it too. It felt as if his body had been mangled by all the nine biju, left out to rot and was beaten again by the jubi. Then he heard a lot of shouting, curses, screams, and more cursing and, was that monkey that just laughed at him? Oh great now I'm going insane too just great. Feeling someone come to his side Naruto began to twitch his eyes open as he felt someone nudge him, whoever it was, was trying to speak to him he was sure. But his hearing was dulled out of by a constant ringing that just wouldn't censoring stop. Feeling his vision begin to clear Naruto began adjusting to the lighting he was in which wasn't much since it seemed like it was nighttime. Looking up Naruto was caught by surprise though when he found himself staring back up into a pair of very familiar violet eyes and oh so familiar red hair. Azure blue eyes stared up into a slightly tomato shaped face of a girl who was about his age give or take three years who was staring back at him with an even greater amount of shock and apprehension. Oh Kami, KK Kashina, KK Kashina. So stricken by his shock Naruto wordlessly reached out the young redhead his hand quivering as if the slightest touch of the girl would make her disappear before his very eyes, as if this whole scene was a twisted illusion formulated by his own sick and twisted hallucinations. K. Kashina, Uzumaki, he said her name causing her eyes widen as his hand went to cup her cheek and he felt it. Somehow, some way he felt warm if a bit sweaty flesh, she was real. This wasn't a dream. He wasn't dead. B. But then, where the hell am I? Uzumaki Kashina, Age 13, pariah of Konohagakure, Kunoichi in training and first female Hokage hopeful had always been a girl that was driven by her guts rather than her smarts. She always followed her instincts which has helped her more times than she could possibly count. Relying on her gut instinct than her brain had saved her from buying rotten food and expired milk, overpaying for her daily necessities and knowing when to flee from drunk people that would begin to follow her. Her instincts had allowed her to evade those type of people and since then had served her quite well. Especially sign she was, for reasons unknown to her at the time, hated by the majority of Konohagakur's populace, citizen and shinobi alike. But now she knew why, on this night she learned as to why people hated her, despised her very existence and loathed her everywhere she went.
She had finally learned the one thing she had always wanted to know, so desperately wished to know. However she didn't expect to find out from her traitorous sensei, Mizuki. The very same who just tried to kill her not, but a few moments ago. She learned that she was the Jinchuriki of the Kayubi no Yoko, jailer of the legendary beast that was said to be able cause natural disasters with a single flick of its nine tails. Holder of the very same biju that 13 years ago, the day of her birth July 10th, had mysteriously appeared and began to ravage Konoha. The day she was supposedly born and the day Konoha's beloved Yandaimi Hokage, Namikaze Minato had died defeating the biju in battle. You are the demon everyone fears. You are the monster that nearly destroyed Konoha. It is because of you everyone lost something important to them on that night. Including me and Aruka's parents, you are the Kayubi. The words of Mizuki still run freshly in her mind as she ran and ran as far her legs could possibly take her. Sweat poured from her face as she took in gulps of oxygen, her face flushed red as she exerted her body to keep moving. Her long red hair, a trait she's come to despise due to the fact it and her slightly round face made her look like a tomato by the kami themselves how she hated that title, in the eyes of her generation, billowed wildly as she ran through the forests outside of Konoha. Her violet eyes were wide in fright and confusion as she ran away from Mizuki and Aruka as she tried to figure out all that had been revealed to her. I is he right? Am I really the Kayubi? T that would explain why everyone hates and treats me like garbage, insults me and looks at me with so much hate. The young Uzumaki thought. It was a startling revelation that shook her to her very core. More so because after that she was nearly killed by Mizuki but she was able to move away in time from being killed by one of Mizuki's Fuma shuriken. Her other sensei from the academy, Amino Uruka had acted weird after Mizuki told her what she was and last she saw hadn't tried to stop the weapon from killing her. What if he was like the others and was only nice to her just to have her guard drop and take her out like all the others? The thought pained her, but it would make sense since it's happened before. Panting Kashina turned a corner and put her back against a tree taking a moment to catch her breath and reel in all that's happened to her in just these few short hours. She failed the academy exam, again, losing her final chance at becoming a kunoichi of Konoha. Being ridiculed, jeered and taunted by her classmates because of her failure. Being looked at by those eyes by the parents of her former classmates. Then being approached by Mizuki with another way she could graduate which at the time filled her with the smallest spark of hope that she agreed to it without hesitation. Not thinking of how ludicrous it all sounded, I mean really, who the hell sends an academy student to steal the forbidden scroll undetected from the Hokage's residence as a secret graduation test? She gripped at the hem of her shirt, biting at her lower lip enough to draw blood as she cursed herself for her stupidity for agreeing to something like that. I should have known it was too good to be true. I'm such an idiot to have believed this was all a secret test. Stealing the forbidden scroll from the old man undetected and delivering it to Mizuki. Real good job Kashina. She cursed vehemently at herself for believing in Mizuki for even a moment. The joy she felt of having another change at becoming a kunoichi of Konoha had erased all suspicions she would regularly have about those type of shady deals. And because of that she had marked herself as a criminal, stealing the forbidden scroll from the Hokage, which was much easier than she expected. That act alone she was sure would throw her from the kettle and into the proverbial censoring fire. Although she had learned something from the scroll, just to pass the time as she waited. But that changed nothing as she was soon found by Aruka and not soon either Mizuki. Which led up to her learning the truth of who or exactly what she was and at the same time nearly being killed by her former sensei. Her legs felt weak, but adrenaline pumped through her body which kept her standing. However, her mind was in turmoil over everything she's learned. Being betrayed by your sensei, having someone to take your life not once but twice had taken its toll on her. Not to mention she was the jailer for the strongest biju to ever walk the elemental nations. Yeah she doubted anyone could understand her situation. Making sure everything was safe for the moment Kashina slid down and leaned her head against the tree, the forbidden scroll in hand. Having fled with it after the revelation told to her. Sweat dripped from her face and taking a few breaths the young redhead began to look up at the sky. Seeing the starry night sky. The twinkling the stars and the few clouds in the sky brought a smile to her face. Unlike her the clouds and the stars beyond her world seemed to be free from being tormented like her. Unlike her who was finding that she was chained down by her status, the clouds and stars seemed to be free and always able to do what they wished and how they wanted without consequence. Yeah, that kind of life sounded really awesome now that she thought about it. 
No more hateful villagers, no more having to look over her shoulder in her own home, no more having to buy overpriced food that was expired or rotted. But reality soon settled in and a single tear fell from her eye as she knew something like that would be forever beyond her grasp now that she knew what she was. Besides, I'm alone in this world, I have no family, my classmates see me as a dobie, I have no one to come home to. I wonder if I would even be missed if I died here, probably not. In a rare moment of silent desperation, knowing full well though it wouldn't happen though, Kashina brought her hands together in a silent prayer of plea. She had never believed in religion, never had, since she believed in doing things herself than hoping on some invisible deity to help you with your troubles. But this was the very first time she was pushed to the brink of helplessness. The first time she knew without a doubt her instincts and Kunoichi training wouldn't save her. Fighting one full-fledged Chunin was suicide for an academy student, but if Iruka indeed was going to try and kill her then any hope of surviving would be thrown to the four winds. Which is why, Uzumaki Kashina, prayed to whatever deity that was listening for anything to help her. To help her come out of this alive, she didn't count in the fact what would be done to her by the Hokage if she did, she just wanted to live. Was that so wrong? Was it selfish of her to just want to indulge in one selfish wish to survive this and live out her life in whatever way she wished? At that moment she didn't care of becoming a Kunoichi of Konoha, she didn't care about becoming its first female Hokage, Kashina just wanted to live. You um, I don't know how this should go, but if there is anyone out there listening, which you're probably not, can you hear my plea? I, I don't want to die, I want to live. I don't care how it happens or whatever it may happen now or in the future, but please, I just want to live. Please. Tears ran down her cheeks as she gave her silent plea and after a moment or two her arms dropped limply at her sides. Great now I feel like an idiot. What was I thinking? It's not like anyone would help me. Who would help me? I mean after all I am a demon aren't I? No one. Especially the kami would soil their hands to help someone as pathetic and weak as me. She said, not really caring anymore if Mizuki or Aruka heard her. If she was going to die, then so be it. Briefly Kashina missed the sky above her flickering all over the elemental nations before a speeding golden light suddenly pierced through the atmosphere of her world. Its brilliant golden radiance seemed to light up the entire world as it raced across the sky at speeds that defied logic. I wonder, what it would have been like, to know what it's like to protect it for once? To be kept safe in the arms of someone I could trust? To know the warmth and friendship of a true friend? To know I could come home knowing someone would be there waiting for me to welcome me home with open arms? The young redhead thought to herself as more tears began to fall. Her ears perked up as she heard Mizuki or Aruka heading her way. Above the elemental nations, many nocturnal types across the continent were odd as a golden light, seemingly a meteorite pierced through their planet's stratosphere. Its rays of gold broke apart the darkness as its trajectory became more clearer by the second. The very sight of this thing sent many people across the nation into hysterics, Monks prayed at their temples and shinobi that knew the trajectory raced back to Konoha. Cages, demios and lords of smaller countries stared up in morbid awe as the anomaly passed over them. It soon passed the borders of Hai no Kuni as its path became clear. The forests of Konohagakure, taking hold of a lock of her long red hair Kashina stared at it aimlessly wondering why was she cursed with such hair. Why was she given this fate to be the pariah of Konoha? Why did the Yandaimi make her into the Jinchuriki of the Kayubi? Why did he have to make her life a living hell all to save a village of people that treated her lower than dirt on the bottom of their shoes? Why? Why her? Not like it matters, I'll soon be dead, imprisoned or executed either way, doesn't matter now. Lowering her head Kashina missed the growing bright golden light that was head directly in her direction. That is until she started to feel a shift in the wind and the ground beginning to quake so she looked up only to go wide-eyed when she saw a giant meteorite bathed in the brightest of gold she had ever seen. It passed right over her by a few feet, but as it did her violet eyes were immediately entranced by the magnificent view she was graced with. However as it passed her, her eyes narrowed when she saw something strange in the rock. W was there something in that rock? Then it touched ground and Kashina was knocked off her feet as the meteorite from space hit ground. The resounding shockwave of the initial contact ripped across the forests knocking Kashina off her feet as well as ripping out trees from the ground and rupturing the very earth. Ah! Kashina let out a surprised shout before she was sent tumbling back by the shockwave. The sky and the earth were scarred by this object as its path had carved a straight line through the planet tearing apart the clouds and reducing parts of the forests outside of Konoha into ruin. Trees burned into embers, 
scorched earth was ruptured into a long deep trench before it finally ended a few meters away from Kashina's direction. Ah! My head won't stop spinning. Groaning the young redhead held her head as she struggled to get up on her feet. The shockwave of the impact had knocked her a bit away from where she originally was. For a brief moment she felt a bit silly for not bracing herself for the inevitable impact of the space rock. But damn what was that, T.T. Ebane. Growing curious and seeing as whatever this was bought her sometime she backtracked through the now decimated forestry. Heading through ruptured earth and burning trees her eyes caught sight of the deep dirt trench dug up from the rock. Walking to the edge she looked down and gave a small shudder at just how far and deep the trench went. Taking a step back the redhead blinked before her eyes went along the trench before coming to an end of where she felt the rock thing stopped. Curiosity flooded her being and soon she began to follow the trench not noticing the two shadows watching her every move. She continued to walk until she finally came to the epic center where the rock had stopped and what she found made her eyes widen greatly as her feet touched the edge of a giant crater. It was about three miles in circumference and a good ten feet into the earth. Warily she looked further into the crater to see a giant rock which was letting off a good amount of smoke or steam, of which she wasn't sure. Still eager, like a child, she sat down and slid into the crater not noticing the shadows that loomed above the crater, two pairs of eyes watching her every move as she got closer to the strange object that just fell from the sky. And it was because of her unawareness of her surroundings Kashina never saw them come closer. Until she heard some come whistling through the wind and our eyes widened, at the last minute she rolled to the left dodging a kanai which was meant to pierce her skull. Spinning around Kashina was met a lot more kanai and shuriken being hurled at her from the shadows of the forest. Kunoichi training kicking in she pulled out a kanai and began to block as many of them as she could, but the speed at which they were thrown and way they curved in their path was far too much and soon she began to be pelted by a few stray shuriken and kanai. Ah! Damn! She cursed as shuriken sliced at her legs, arms and chest reducing much of her clothing to tatters. She gave a strangled cry as one kanai went straight into her thigh. Giving a curse she looked up to see more coming her way. Gritting her teeth she jumped back dodging the hail of deadly weapons. Upon hearing footsteps heading her way she looked up only for her eyes to widen momentarily before they glazed over in betrayal. So, you're trying to kill me too Uruka sensei. The redhead said as she looked at the two men before her, her former senseis at the academy. Mizuki and Amino Uruka the former giving a deranged smirk as he glared at her as if she were an abomination of an unholy nature. The other, Aruka, looked at her, with those eyes. Filled with hatred that had been suppressed for so long, sadness, anger, pain into much for her to see or even care at that moment. Of course he is, he's come to realize you need to die for all the people you killed that night. The Yandaimi couldn't kill you Kayubi, but he has left people like us to finish what he started. By weakening you Kayubi, he has left you defenseless in your mortal body. And we're gonna make you suffer for everything you've done to us, demon. Mizuki spat whilst Aruka narrowed his eyes before glancing to the silver haired shinobi. I thought we agreed to make her death quick and painless, Mizuki. He said only to get a glare from the man who tsked at his comrade. Don't get sentimental now, Aruka. That thing isn't even a human being, it's a monster under the guide of a human appearance. You've aided me so far, so don't get soft me now. Remember that it is because of that thing we lost our parents. It is because of her Konoha was nearly annihilated that night. Don't you remember all the suffering and death on that night? It was because of that. Mizuki said pointing his finger at Kashina as his eyes glared fiercely at Aruka who remained unresponsive for a moment before he turned his gaze on Kashina. Oh no. The redhead thought as she saw the Umino's eyes alit with a hate-filled anger that could only be quenched with her painful death. She didn't even have a chance as Aruka threw another kanai at her, but it only hit the ground in front of her. Thinking he missed for a moment, she was proven wrong when she heard paper sizzling causing her eyes to look down. An explosive tag. Die, Kayubi no Kitsune. Briefly she heard Aruka shout out in hatred, but Kashina reacted as fast as she could, her instincts shot up high and she spun and jumped, but didn't have enough time to evade the explosion's minor shockwave. Ow. She gave a grunt as she blown back before her body hit the giant stone which miraculously didn't scorch her after it just hurtled itself from space. Spitting up a blood upon the stone, the young Uzumaki struggled to get up as the two shinobi began to approach. So is this another of your tricks Kayubi? A last resort? Strange, it was said you could cause natural disasters with your tails, but not cause rocks to fall from the sky. A last resort, perhaps. 
Mizuki pondered on it before shrugging as Kashina lay motionless against the stone. Ah well even if it was you failed and now, you're going to feel the pain and anguish you inflicted upon us all those years ago, demon. He said and within an unspoken signal he and Aruka charged toward Kashina, Kanai drawn and eyes completely murderous. Yet they were completely ignorant of what lay inside that very stone. Not caring anymore if she was going to live or die Kashina's violet eyes fell on the stone, now that she had a better look at it. He was a strange one, unlike the boulders and other rocks or stones she's seen this one was abnormally formed. It was rugged in places, chipped and broken off in other places, but it was strange in the sense because it had a humanoid shape to it. It was a rough way at looking at it, but she could strangely see it having the shape of a human. But then she felt something, it was a soft thrum that reached to her body and caused a strange tingle to go through her system. Starting from her fingers, hands and throughout the rest of her body. Entranced and apprehensive at the same time she peered closer into the stone, and faintly she could hear a hum of something within. Strange, it's as if, something it calling out to me, is it from this thing? She wondered briefly until she noticed some of our blood had splattered across the stone. But the strange thing she saw was that her blood began to glow a bright crimson before it was absorbed into the stone. W what the? She muttered, but didn't have time to think another thought as the stone began to react violently before a piercing golden light shot out of the stone. It blinded her vision and caused the two chunin to stumble in their charge. Raising their arms to shide their eyes the two stopped, but Kashina somehow got used to the golden light and stared, transfixed by the brilliant radiance that she was bathed in as more and more golden light burst out from the stone. More and more came until it exploded in a brilliant flash of gold. Ah! What the hell is this light? Aruka stated. I've no idea. Shit is the Kayubi doing something? Mizuki replied. Due to the intensity of the light it left them blind for several moments as it began to fade and as it did it revealed that where the stone originally was. But it was gone and in its place was something that was entirely unexpected. For right there, in the very center of the giant crater where once was a meteorite had been was a human. Correction. It was a man bathed in a faint glowing gold light that outlined his body and the redhead was at his side seemingly just as shocked if not more so by this sudden development. Her violet eyes were wide in shock as she soaked up the man's appearance in the span of a second, but did a double take on him just to make sure what she saw was real. It was a man to be sure, a teenager possibly three years older than herself who had a tanned complexion. Slightly long spiky locks of the purest gold she had ever seen fell around his head which went down to his shoulder blades and covered his ears. His bangs nearly hid his eyes which were closed. Looking at his face she saw the strangest thing which was a whiskers that marred his cheeks, they faintly resembled whiskers from a kitsune. Then her eyes rested on the teen's body and what she saw nearly made her hurl as his body was literally drenched in blood. His clothes were in tatters revealing parts of his body which was a good sight to see. Flesh was torn and even his left leg looked like it was burned to a crisp. Blood spilled from every part of his body, stained his golden hair red. The red liquid of life pooled around his body yet it didn't deter the young redhead the slightest. Why? Simply put the moment she laid her hands on the man she felt a rush of a familiar yet unrecognizable energy flow through her. It was unseeable, but she felt something flow through her fingertips and all the way into her chakra network the moment she touched the blonde. Not realizing it she let out a breath as her energy high came down and not realizing her cheeks were flushed from the mysterious experience. Idly she noted the blonde was actually sleeping from the way his chest moved up and down, but how he was in the state he was in she wouldn't know. Then again he had just fallen from the censoring sky so she wasn't entirely she if he is even human or some horrible tentacled alien that's come to take over their world. Okay. That sounded a bit far-fetched, even for me, T.T. Ebane, she thought with a sweat drop. Shaking her head she nudged the blonde man not seeing Aruka and Mizuki beginning to regain their sense of vision and continuing to nudge him she was rewarded a grunt for her efforts. Pouting a bit, she nudged harder and spoke out the man hoping he would wake up. Oi! Blondie wake up! She said and when she saw his face twitch she stopped before his eyes began to twitch some more before they slowly began to open. Upon seeing Biss' eyes her breath hitched when she saw the most beautiful pair of blue eyes she had ever seen. She didn't care for a moment when they widened in unadulterated shock for she was just too entraced by this blonde cerulean blue orbs. Staring so long into them Kashina felt as if she were looking into two twin pools of liquid sapphire. It was entrancing her, transfixing her on the spot as Azure met Violet in a stare down that lasted a moment or two, but felt like hours. P. 
pee pretty, she was shaken from her stupor though when the man reached up to her face with his trembling bloody hand before he cupped her cheek. The wetness of his blood stained her cheek, but the astounding amount of foreign warmth that shot through her body upon contact with his hand made her freeze up. His touch was tender, and although his hand stained her cheek in blood it made her body tremble from the amount of desperation she felt course through his touch. It was as if he were seeing an illusion, a figment of his imagination come to life just to haunt him. Perhaps it was on an impulse but totally forgetting her situation she let her hand go up to his just to reassure what he saw wasn't a dream, she wasn't an illusion. That she was in fact a real living, breathing human. It seemed to work as his eyes widened even more so before he spoke, his voice dry which he was in desperate in need of water, but she heard him clearly. K. Kashina, Uzumaki, now it was her turn to be flooded with shock, this man who just fell from the sky just spoke her name. And the way he said her name made her want to take a step back, as if what she just felt from him was a lie. She may have been only 13 years old, but due to her childhood and upbringing she was very sensitive to the emotions of the people around her. It was an innate skill she's developed which has helped her more than she could ever count when deciphering the emotions of people that have wanted to help her. But the emotion she sensed from this guy, it was numbing. That's all she could say. Emotions that she had experienced in her short 13 years of life slammed into her, only at much a deeper and stronger level than she had ever known. Deep-seated sorrow, anguish, pain, happiness, confusion and many others swirled about inside her as she stared down at the man in surprise. H how does he, know my name? A and why does he feel that way when he sees me? W who is this guy? And it was because of that state of shock Kashina was in that she missed the fact both Mizuki and Aruka had recovered from their temporary blindness. And upon seeing their target now kneeling before a critically injured teen, where once that strange space rock used to be, they acted. The Kyubi fails in even summoning an ally. What a joke you've become, almighty Biju my ass. No more tricks. Die. Mizuki shouted before he and Aruka threw a hail of shuriken and kanai the latter of which had a number of more explosive tags tied to the ends of them. She was unaware of this, but the blonde teen below her wasn't. His azure blue eyes widened when he saw the deadly weaponry headed toward the redhead's unprotected back and by some force of will he moved faster than even a fully matured Sharingan could see. In one swift motion he wrapped his arm around Kashina and pulled her to his chest earning a shocked, eep, from her before he spun around and throwing out his hand he glared toward the Chunin. And in that next second, the very air itself stilled as a mysterious force practically exploded from Naruto's hand which collided with the shuriken and kanai. It ripped the ground asunder before the force along with the weapons blew back towards the two chunin. Their own weapons pelted them as the stray kanais luckily bypassed them before they exploded in the woods behind them. However the bone-crushing force alone blew them back causing them to slam into deep crater walls behind them. Both gasped as their spines bent before snapping but somehow they were unable to scream as an unimaginable killing intent fell upon them. Feeling the hairs on the back of their necks stand up they dared to look up only to be rewarded with a sight they, literally, made them soil themselves in terror. If they had thought the Kyubi no Kitsune was a demon, then what in the blue censoring hell was this thing? Chakra rippled out of every pore of this man's body and an unseeable force thrummed out from his very soul which cracked the ground he stood upon. His mortal and fatal wounds mattered little to him as his eyes froze the two poor Chunin on the spot. What was once azure blue eyes were gone and in their place were glowing icy blue eyes that could freeze hell over a hundred times over. Completely ignorant of what was happening behind her, Kashina was too enraptured by the heat and protective warmth this man gave her. She was sure that she was just attacked, but this man whom she thought was on death's door had sprung him and in a move faster than she could even blink had her whole body in his arms. Her whole body rested against him with her head resting on his somewhat bloody chest. She couldn't speak or utter a word as she was too occupied with absorbing all his warmth he gave her, protection she so craved for years. Instinctively she snuggled more into his arms which he noted for a second and in that second of glancing her way his eyes widened when he saw her injuries which fueled the raging fire that was building up within him. Seeing the kanai impaled in her thigh and her blood beginning to leak from her body was the ignition that set that fire into a blazing inferno, shifting the young redhead a bit more in his arms so he didn't irritate her wounds more than they already were he set his unnatural gaze on the two shinobi, and if looks could kill they'd. Oh wait, I don't care where I am, but I see Mizuki Teme and Aruka, Aruka aiding to try and kill Kashina, they're dead, no questions, they will die. 
His eyes flashed light blue and in an unspoken command he glared down at the men before their eyes widened when they felt their throats begin to constrict cutting off ho so precious oxygen from entering their lungs. Uck! Mizuki gurgled as Naruto's lifted up and with it so did they as their bodies slowly begin to lift up into the air to meet Naruto's gaze. But Naruto didn't so much as flinch at their suffering, even as their faces began to turn blue he remained stony as he stared them in the eye. Then he uttered a single word which seemed to resonate all throughout the clearing. Die you wretched scum, snap. His eyes flashed again and in unseen movement both their throats were crushed, their eyes widened as they clawed at their throats, but it was in vain as they slowly died. Their bodies twitched and convulsed before Naruto swiped his gaze to the side sending the limp bodies in the same direction. He felt Kashina flinch from the sound but sent a small thrum of chakra to ease her worries as his eyes glanced every direction as he soaked in the area he is in. He knew this place, how could he not, it's the very same forest where he found out he was Kurama's Jinchuriki and the day he became a genin shinobi of Konoha. Yet, it seems things are different, the last thing I remember was throwing that white hole into Nagato's Chibaku Tensai. Getting censored it into the wormhole, closing my eyes, then I wake up here. Then he looked down at the one thing that made everything so different, and that was the young Kashina in his arm and it was because of her alone, her very existence is what threw him off. He was sure Kashina had died in his time, giving her life to save him from Kurama. Wait. His eyes narrowed as his mind ran miles per millisecond as he worked on a theory, if what he was thinking was true then. That's it, that wormhole didn't kill me although I feel like it. It sent back into the past, but that doesn't explain Kashina being here and I can sense Kurama's chakra in her. Have. I changed something from the norm that was in the past. It confounded him as to how Kashina was here and having Kurama in her since he could clearly sense Kurama was still inside him although the Biju was fast asleep. Possibly secluding himself so to concentrate on healing his fatal wounds he was sure. But such thoughts were quickly shaken from him as his injuries caught up to him and he fell to a knee, coughing up blood he glanced over his body and he felt he had much more damage than his outward appearance suggested. Busted ribcage, punctured lung, scorched leg how he was even standing he wasn't sure numerous lacerations and gashes coincided with torn tissue and ripped flesh. That wasn't even counting the fact he was losing a lot of blood. Faintly he sensed more shinobi coming, but logically he knew he couldn't even move lest he risk increasing the rate of which he would die. He kept Kashina close as he looked up to see faint images of shinobi at the edge of the crater, along with a man dressed in very familiar white robes and hat. His eyes narrowed in alarm and even as his vision began to get blurry he swiped his hand at Shinobi who neared him and Kashina sending them back as a warning. Holding her protectively he glared at them, daring them to come closer. But then his body reached its limit, his vision darkened and he felt his body fall forward, but unconsciously as to not injure Kashina any more than she already was he twisted his body so that he fell first. Shit, not them, not, Konoha Shinobi, not, that, old, monkey. He struggled to open his eyes and yet the only thing he saw was worried Violet staring down at him before he looked up to see the old man, Serutobi Hirazan staring down at him with pity, damn old man, don't give me that look, and thus Naruto's vision went black, his consciousness fading numbing him from Kashina's shouts of concern for him whilst the man who manipulated him since he was a child in his past life stood at her side staring down at him. Frustration was the emotion he felt as he was completely at the mercy of Konohagakur's Sandame Hokage, Serutobi Hirazan. Or was he? Serutobi Hirazan was a very weary man. That was a fact no one could or would even dare to deny, he'd been Hokage for so long not many could match him in his time in service. Besides the current Suchikage that is, Serutobi Hirazan was an old man, a veteran of all three Shinobi World Wars, the student of the Shodai and Naidame Hokages, because of that, his experience was vast and reaching far beyond many. It was because of that long time in service as a Hokage and as a shinobi that he'd bore witness to feats and scenes that defied all logic and understanding. Like the legendary rivalry between his sensei Senju Hashirama and Uchiha Madara, a rivalry that led to a battle that was still spoken of in legends. A battle between gods among shinobi, He'd bore witness to the sheer raw destructive power of all the nine legendary bijus and how powerful and vicious they could be. After all most were utilized in the wars he's fought and knew how useful they were in battle as super weapons of war. He'd seen the weakest of them, the Ichibi reduce an entire mountain into nothing with a single bijudama. And he had even seen a single man and his late successor, 
Namikaze Minato the Yandaimi Hokage, in a few seconds flat lay waste to platoons of Iwagakure Shinobi in the Third Shinobi World War. It had come at a cost of course, Minato had spent his chakra pool to its limit and lost half of his life force as a result. But it was because of that slaughter the Third War ended in Konoha's favor because of Minato's actions. So one could say Hiruzen had seen it all, everything that defied all logic and all things he had come to know. He'd figured he had come to witness everything life had to offer because of that, but it seemed he was proven wrong. Very wrong, when not a week ago he'd witnessed an incident that shook his whole world and the entire elemental continent to its very core. And that was the mysterious comet incident as it was being called now. It had happened a week ago and still the whole continent was on the fritz over what happened and Hiruzen couldn't blame any of the daimyos, his fellow cages or minor lords for being nervous. It was not every day you see a mysterious flying comet fall from the sky and slam into a country. Thinking back nothing like that had ever occurred in the history of the world, or as far as Hiruzen knew. But because of that incident alone it sent everything into a frenzy. He'd received reports from his spies across the continent that every village was mobilizing their forces to be stationed at their borders. To be cautious of anything like that happening again, but to Hiruzen it was a familiar action he'd seen happen during his times in the wars, which put him on edge more than he would ever admit. Which is why he himself had acted with the backing of his advisor's full support. He postponed the graduation for a month after a day when the incident occurred. Had all his Jonin, Chunin and Jenin Shinobi pulled back into the village and put Konoha under a black level alert. A special protocol alarm to hurdle all his Shinobi and prepare for the worst while he and the Konoha council would plan on what they should do. To discuss on what had happened and if it should happen again what they would need to do should it occur. And it was because of those talks Hiruzen was currently walking towards the Konoha hospital. While he had talked with the Konoha council he was visiting the only person that could give the answers to what happened that night. It was of a man whose existence Hiruzen had kept secret from every single person, even the Anbu that came with him that night was ordered to never unveil the secret under the penalty of execution. Severe? Perhaps, but it was needed in this situation. This was a predicament of an unknown element and he would take every precaution needed to protect the village first and foremost. As for this person, well Hiruzen had him under guard and was kept confined in one of the hospital rooms with Anbu watch both inside and out along with a number of seals and alarms placed everywhere in the room should he even shown a sign of physical movement. That had been done the moment he had been found by him and his personal Anbu. After all this man had been found at the exact location where the comet had hit so he was under a lot of watch. But Hiruzen wouldn't admit, but he did have reasons of his own to want to meet the man, he'd come to visit him daily. After all, this man supposedly saved Uzumaki Kashina from two traitors, Mizuki and Amino Uruka even in the state he was in. That was both heroic and suspicious in and of itself. But Kashina had heatedly vouched for the man stating he saved her from being killed which was a good thing considering Kashina's importance to Konoha's overall security so he'd give her that. But that was only one of the personal reasons he'd come to visit this blonde man. The other reason was because he was compelled to see that this man was not a figment of his imagination. When he found him on that night, he was stricken in mute horror, it was as if he was looking at a carbon copy of Namikaze Minato himself. The very man that died 13 years ago to seal the Kayubi no Yoko into Uzumaki Kashina, his newborn daughter. It was as if a ghost had come back to haunt him for all his mistakes. There was no arguing the fact, that this blonde stranger looked nearly identical to the Yandaimi Hokage, a fact his personal Anbu had exclaimed when they saw him. But they would not utter a word lest they value their lives. But, it was a serious issue nonetheless, everyone believed Minato had died and Hiruzen had personally seen the man and his wife die that night. He'd personally oversaw their funeral himself. So how was it this this Minato look like could appear, and in such a mysterious manner? Was it a sign of the kami? Was it an impending omen thrown upon him for all his failures and sins? He wasn't sure, but he knew one thing was for sure. If there was one person that had any possible clue as to what that incident was. It was that single man, walking into the hospital he nodded his head at the lady at the front desk before he was quickly met with the head doctor that oversaw all high profile patients. He was a middle aged man with a bald head, a grey goatee and slightly round grey eyes. He walked with experience and confidence in his skills as a doctor and Hiruzen knew first hand the man lived up to his reputation. It is why he had him to be the head over the mysterious man's operation. An operation he ordered to be kept a secret, if not he would be stripped of his status and forced to live in the darkest slums Konoha had to offer for the rest of his life. 
there was no room for any potential information leaks in this type of situation and Hirazan would make damned sure there wouldn't be any. He certainly didn't want that old war hawk finding out about this. Report. He commanded and the doctor obliged. Hi Hokage Sama. A doctor obliged his leader with a respectful nod before pulling out his clipboard as he and the Hokage walked down a hallway. The patient has been showing a remarkable amount of recovery from the time when he was first brought here. As you have seen, the night he was brought in a lot of us, including myself, thought he would die. The kid was literally brushing himself with death from the amount of injuries he had. Outwardly his body seemed to have gone through a shredder. Multiple lacerations and gashes scarred his entire body, from his head to his toes. His left leg suffered from a severe third-degree burn from the knee on down. His flesh seemed to have been torn apart from random parts all over his body. And that was just his external injuries. He said while Hirazan nodded as the doctor continued. As for his internal injuries, he had a completely busted ribcage, a punctured lung with parts of the ribs nearly piercing the aorta near his heart. His right shoulder was dislocated, and his skull was fractured, but there was no signs of potential damage to the brain or stem. He was also suffering from a high case of internal and external bleeding. Quite honestly, Hokage-sama, for this man to have lived through all that, he must have had someone watching over him. He said whilst Hirazin hummed in thought. He'd seen worse in war, but this was a unique case since all the injuries seemed to have been inflicted in a way that was both at random, but was meant to kill the teen, but somehow failed to. Hum, continue. Very well, and here the doctor seemed to skip over a few papers on his clipboard before continuing. Since then, we've poured in every resource we had to pull this man back from death's door. Even utilizing techniques Tsunade Sama left behind to regenerate the lost bones in his ribcage. It was overall a close call, but he managed well. Survived the whole process and has been making a clean recovery since then. We've had zero difficulties with him, well besides his continued, coma. He added with slight hesitance which Hirazan nodded at. I see, to be expected of course after his whole ordeal. He added which the doctor agreed with. The doctor nor those that worked on the boy knew where he'd come from. Again, only he and the Anbu that were there that night knew, but if he had to he could spin a story off for the public until he reached a more solid conclusion as to who exactly this man was. However the man's, um friend has come again to see him. Has been since this early morning. He admitted to his Hokage who rose an eyebrow, but nodded all the same. He knew who he was talking about, he'd encountered the blonde's friend during his daily visits and still it both confounded him and made him apprehensive as to how exactly this blonde teen had done the impossible. He'd literally gained a friend in the one person that petrified his whole village and scared her current generation with her anger alone. As he and the doctor cut a corner he found his eyes looking through the window to see inside the room where lay a blonde-haired man in a hospital bed. His whole body was wrapped in bandages with his left leg held up high and in a cast. He could clearly see he was still inside his coma, but then as he and the doctor entered through the door he saw seated beside the man. Was none other than the very girl this blonde Monado clone saved from being killed. Uzumaki Kashina. He stayed silent and merely observed the redhead. This was a rare scene for him to witness from the girl that was usually loud, quick to anger, brashful and obnoxious. He'd seen it a few times during his visits, but now as he looked at it again he was still left inwardly shocked at how different the girl seemed to be. What he saw was Kashina sitting in a chair at the blonde's bedside, merely holding his hand. Her round violet eyes seemingly staring at the mon's whiskered visage with a look of deep emotional concern for his well-being. Her face set in a solemn frown as her thumb went in circles on top of the mon's hand. Seeing her like this had both shocked and made him apprehensive. That incident had scarred her far more than he thought it would, and with the only reason she was still alive laid out in bed recovering from mortal, fatal injuries had quieted her down a few notches. It honestly worried him, she'd been silent most of the time in her visits. Just coming to down at the break of dawn and stay at the mon's side for hours on end at times. At one point Hirazan had even found her asleep in her chair while grasping at the blonde's hand in a surprisingly tight grip. Whatever interaction she had with this man on that night had done something to her, something he couldn't wrap his head around. She absolutely hated, and he meant it when she hated to leave him at night. Almost downright getting aggressive which led to him having to take her back home himself. He didn't know, that whatever happened that night, Kashina had somehow someway formed a bond with this man, and he wasn't entirely sure if that was a good thing or a bad thing. He tried to ask her of what happened that night, 
but she refused to say anything which he figured was because of how traumatizing it all was for her. Will he ever wake up, Hokage-sama? Kashina said and Hiruzen had to hold back a flinch as if he had just been slapped. He was still getting used to the fact Kashina was addressing him in a respectful manner which did not bode well for him. She usually called him old man or some other disrespectful title. It was, so unlike her it scared him to be entirely honest. Sighing, he looked to the doctor and nodded which the man returned before walking out before he walked up to Kashina's side and put a hand on her shoulder. I, honestly don't know Kashina. He was very injured when he saved you, it was a miracle he survived whatever it was he went through. I say he just needs rest, he'll wake up eventually. He said patting the young girl's shoulder which she showed little visible reaction to besides a small nod of her head. However unknown to Hiruzen's thoughts, Kashina's mind was in a state of absolute turmoil. Had been since that night, he had been right about being traumatized from it, but not in a manner of which he thought it would be. On that night, Kashina truly felt like she was going to die, having learned of what she was, and nearly killed by her former senseis had shaken her to her very core. She had prayed to the kami on that night for some small semblance for aid, to live through it just so she could continue to live and experience all the things she hadn't been able to. To know what it was like to have a true friend, to come home knowing someone would be there waiting for her with open arms. To have someone at her side and feel what it would be like to be safe without having to look over your shoulder everywhere you went. To not have to hold a kanai under your pillow for any surprise attacks on her. She had expected to not receive an answer, to be ignored because of what she was. To be denied so the kami didn't have to soil their hands because of her filthy existence. But it had come, in the most unexpected of ways and all she had ever wished for in that prayer had come to her in all in one go. She squeezed the blonde's single hand, his much bigger one engulfing hers, but she could feel the rhythm of his heartbeat through their contact. It eased her and made her sigh in relief, the warmth of his touch was still alien to her, but she was easily getting used to it. Even in his coma state the confusing blonde made her feel safe and secure just by being near him and even more by being in contact with him. She hadn't felt this way before, that she knew for sure. When with the blonde, coming to visit him every day had set her distress at ease when he was still alive and breathing, but left disappointed that he was still in a coma. But when having to be forced to leave him left her becoming very aggressive, more than she ever got before, even when picked on. It was like, to be forced away from him set of a trigger in her that erupted in a very violent eruption that would end up with a lot of people hurt with only the Hokage being able to stop her rampage. It was, strange, but she welcomed it all the same. The blonde made her feel all these emotions that she so wanted to know. She still remembered what it was like when he scooped her up in his arms, in spite of his mortal injuries, as he protected her from Aruka and Mizuki. The feeling of being held in his arms still left her tingling and in want of more of that feeling of being protected. She had been left all her life to fend for herself and to be protected for once had left her wanting more of that feeling. But it was more than that, the redhead was definitely sure, as she stared the blonde's whiskered face. She wasn't sure why. But ever since she made eye contact with him with his beautiful blue eyes, and the first time she touched him. That strange feeling of absorbing something from the blonde had left her flustered from the experience, but she was sure it had done something to her. Because she could not get him out of her head, literally. Every time I close my eyes I see his face, his blue eyes, and those cute whiskers. I see him there, and when I do I feel like I want to hug him and never let go. I feel so, happy, joyous, and ecstatic. But at the same time I feel like I want to weep when I see him, I feel so much sadness, sorrow and anguish at those times. W what's happened to me? It scared her to be honest as to why she was feeling this way for the blonde. But she was sure what she felt was genuine since she went into such violent emotional outbursts when forced to leave his side. Or left thinking alone in her apartment if he was okay, will he be fine? And coming back and feeling so much relief when she saw he was okay. She was confused, scared even, but one thing was for sure. For Kashina, the most important thing she wanted in this world at the moment was for the blonde to wake up. He saved her from certain death and she wanted to express her gratitude correctly. And yet a little voice in the back of head whispered that she wanted to have that same feeling of being in his arms again. To know that feeling again, to experience it again, to yearn for the feeling his arms holding her close. This time, she was the one being protected instead of her having to always fend for herself. She finally had someone to be at her side. Her hands unconsciously tightened their hold on the blondes whose own hands seemed to twitch at the action before his fingers slowly began to close around her smaller hands. 
If only they knew what was going on in Naruto's mind. Naruto's mindscape. I must say, that was a very good move, suppressing your healing factor while they operated on you was flawless. Well executed move on your part, to blow them off any potential trail of you having any ties to that Kashina girl. A voice spoke within the depths of Naruto's mindscape, going far beyond the cage that kept Kurama sealed even. It went far deeper until it came upon a door of sorts which led to a different sort of chamber. It was filled with ankle-deep water and all around the chamber was a seamless expanse of white with the only entrance being a normal-looking door. Only the door had a large circular design on it which had the design of a rinnegan on it with nine magatama in each of the rings. Above that design was nine or magatama on the door. Situated in the middle of this giant expanse of white was two figures, both of whom were sitting in a meditative posture. The first was the one who just spoke, it was a very very old man with a deep wrinkled complexion. He wore a long white howry with a pattern of six magatama around a high collar, beneath which he wore a necklace that consisted of also six red magatama. On the back of said cloak was a red rinnegan like marking along with a pattern of nine red magatama arranged in three rows beneath it. The old man had shaggy light gray hair that spiked up in the front which distinctively resembled two horns along with a chin-length braid that hung in front of his left ear. He also sported a long goatee that reached his waist, his eyes flared out with the fabled rinnegan while on his forehead was a rinnegan like marking similar to the one on the back of his howry. The old man was meditating yet was floating over the water with nine black chakra orbs circling around him while strapped over his back was a shakuho with the base missing a quarter of its ring. The old man seemingly stared at the second person that kept him company in this solitary area of peace and tranquility, his rinnegan eyes observing and ever analyzing the person before him with keen interest. The other person was none other than Uzumaki Naruto who was dressed in his clothing he had with his fight against pain, Nagato only without his crimson haori with black flames licking the bottom. His eyes were closed as he meditated inside the tranquility of his mind his brain processing and orderly organizing every piece of memory he's forgotten when he was too young to remember, and the memories he was shared with by his still sleeping companion, Kurama. It was a needed precaution, knowing Hiruzen he would quickly suspect something and put me under severe watch if not throw me into interrogation, he said without breaking his posture the slight while the older man gave a hum in understanding. True, and that would directly oppose your rather elaborate plan of escape, no. He stated causing Naruto to incline his head giving him a nod. I've been planning this for the whole week and after much consideration and planning I cannot let the slightest slip up pass me by. Going through Kurama's memories has left me with a few places to check out before I leave this village which has caused me to alternate the plan a bit. But it will succeed nonetheless. Naruto responded in kind, no amount of hesitance or doubt in his voice. Something the Rinnegan wielding old man caught and spoke in kind feeling the need to remind his young blonde friend that any plan will almost always have a setback. Oh. How can you be so sure of that? Are you so sure of yourself that you can escape your former home unnoticed? You said so yourself, the village houses some of the most powerful shinobi in the world so escaping from them will prove to be a challenge even for you. Not to mention you have their Hokage to deal with when you wake up. Plus let's not forget the shared aberration you've created that's clinging onto you now like a lifeline he said causing the blonde to frown for the smallest second before it disappeared just as quick. Giving a sigh the blonde opened his eyes to reveal his blue eyes now glimmering with an unworldly icy blue glow. Standing up he began to stretch his muscles before turning to address the old man with an impassive expression. He was still remembering how he met the old man when he entered his mindscape. Kurama was in a deep slumber from the timeline travel having weakened the fox considerably and the big ol' fluffball needed time to recover his full power. He'd met the old man while exploring his mindscape, absorbing all of his long hidden memories as a child to when he was born. That applied to even Kurama's memories who shared them with him because of their close relationship. It was because of that Naruto had come across a door in his mindscape which hadn't been there before or at the time hadn't noticed. It was in that door, Naruto found the old man meditating inside the chamber seemingly waiting for him. And he had to say meeting the man had been a very enlightening experience to say the least. I've already accounted for that old man Hagoromo, I don't fear Konoha in the slightest. Their overall power may be impressive, but I've seen what they can do. Their security has become lax and lazy during these times of temporary peace. Dealing with the Hokage will be a simple matter of mental subterfuge. Here his eyes narrowed down at his hands before he clenched them. 
As for Kashina, she is, my only precious person in this world. Someone I am willing to sell my soul to the devil to protect. Her existence in this timeline is my sin there is no mistaking that, but I will fight tooth and nail so that she doesn't suffer like she did in my old life. Naruto proclaimed clenching his hands whilst the old man, Hagoromo gave Naruto a cold stern look. As if he was measuring him, looking for something in the blonde. And Naruto met the man of legend's stare without a shred of hesitation. And are you willing to face the kami? You have defied their will. You have defied their laws of reality not once, but twice. Are you willing to bring the full wrath of the kami upon you for her sake? Hagoromo questioned Naruto, but again he was met with a resolved stare that could literally quell his mortal enemy a thousand times over. In a heartbeat. I know, because of me the past, the present and the future has forever been altered and for that I will take any consequences needed. But I will not under any circumstance allow Kashina to go through that kind of pain again. The kami are a cruel twisted bunch that get high off their celestial power. If I am to oppose them for Kashina's sake then I will. Besides, like you said Hagoromo sensei, he continued before a strange smirk formed on Naruto's whiskered visage. His eyes began to glow icy blue before his golden hair began to flash silver before it returned to normal, he stared back into Hagoromo. I am the anomaly of this dimension. I am the very thing the kami fear from mortals, our ability to adapt and evolve in any situation. And considering my situation is one of a celestial type, I think I'll be ready in the future should it ever come to that. He said and Hagoromo sensed no amount of arrogance in the teen's tone. Only a resolve hardened through sheer determination and a will power that truly did defy the will of gods. A smirk of cracked across Hagoromo's wrinkled visage before he let out a bellowing laughter that echoed amongst the chamber. Ha ha, well said, then I look forward to what you do this time, my student. Hagoromo said which Naruto just returned with a chuckle of his own. Yes, in this past week as he planned and organized his memories and escape plan he had trained a bit with Hagoromo in his ancient arts. Arts in combat and fuinjutsu that preceded what he currently knew. Combining that with his training his shinobi abilities and what abilities he could use with his mind so far. It was a very humbling experience, but not one he would ever forget, for an old man the guy could still kick his ass all across the chamber and back without much effort. But oh the rewards for the training had been very well worth it. Nodding to the man he sent a wave to the old man, I won't disappoint, Rakudu Dono. He added with a grin making the old man shake his head before he saw Naruto vanish from his mindscape. Doing so, Otsutsuki Hagoromo, the legendary sage of the Six Paths sighed with a deep look of thought overtaking his wizened expression. Once, that boy was the reincarnation of my youngest boy Ashura, but now, now he's so much like Ka-san it's scary. The sage thought referring to his long-dead mother with a solemn expression. Strange, real-world hospital The first thing Naruto noticed when he felt consciousness return to him was the scent of morphine, old people and medicine. A scent that made him want to gag, but held back that reflex and instead began to open his eyes. The sight he was met with was a bright light which came from the sun coming through the blinds on his right. Mentally he accounted for all the people in the room for a split second taking in all the ones inside. Those not hiding and those that were. Two Anbu stationed outside and four more inside the room, then there is a doctor, Saru Teme and, Kashina. Fully he began to open his eyes which began to adjust to the light and once he did he turned his head only to see a sight that made him smile the smallest bit. It was his mo no she wasn't his mother this time around sitting at his bedside with dark bags under her eyes. Her complexion was less than her milky white which worried him. Then he saw her violet eyes land on him and like a trigger they lit up like a thousand suns before she practically flung her arms around his neck. Finally you're awake d-a-t-t-e-b-a-n-e. -E. She practically screamed and he simply chuckled at her behavior before hesitantly patting her on the back. His eyes soon fell on the Hokage who was looking at him with a smile. Which Naruto could tell a mile away was fake. Just seeing the old monkey again made Naruto want to either punch him, kick him or both and burn his old wrinkly ass alive. Ah so good of you to awake, I must say you had Kashina-san very worried, he said causing Naruto to raise an eyebrow missing Kashina's cheeks heat up at what the old man said before quickly letting go of the blonde, but still he noted that she was still on his bed grasping at his hospital gown. Then he looked back at the Hokage and raised an eyebrow as he decided to play the act. Ah, did I now? My apologies Kashina, he said smiling towards the redhead who smiled in return. By the way, let me introduce myself. 
My name is Serutobi Hirazan and this here is Uzumaki Kashina. The man behind me is the one who led to operating on you is, Kochiwa Meizu. He said introducing everyone to which Naruto caught on to what Hirazan was doing. Fishing for his name which he would gladly give. He couldn't exactly say he was an Uzumaki otherwise he would kiss his plan goodbye besides he'd had a week to think of one. And it was, with the blessing of Hagoromo that he got one. So, as Naruto glanced to Hirazan he, smiled, and replied in kind deciding to start his plan now. Ah, so very nice to meet you all. My name is Otsutsuki Naruto, a pleasure to meet you all and especially such a beautiful young lady as yourself, Kashina. He said with a grin to Kashina who went cherry red at his compliment. Oh yes, this was going to be fun. Thanks.